in fact, we have a lot more in common with each other as humans and as people than, you know, some sort of arbitrary kind of artificial borders and boundaries on a map. And my ideal migration policy would be to say, just let everybody in who wants to come in. That's not the way that the world works. The more you try to control migrants, the less they're actually going to be able to contribute to society. Messaging is a very, very powerful in the media, from the government, um, from civil society. Welcome back to the Assan Times YouTube channel. Joining me today is Professor Karis Schenk, who spent years focusing on comparative politics and researching the politics of immigration. Thank you very much, Karis, for joining us today in the studio. Thank you so much for having me. So before we dive into the topic, the main topic of our conversation today, I just want to ask you one question that I was wondering about quite, quite a lot recently, is whether we can stay apolitical these days. It's such a great question because I think part of it depends on what we think about as politics. Yeah. So if we think of only those things that happen in the halls of government as political and only those things that challenge the government as political, um, then we have maybe have one answer to that question. Um, if we think about everything potentially though as political, the interactions between people on the streets, the interactions between people in businesses and the marketplace and educational uh, spheres, if we think of all of that as political in the sense that people are trying to advocate for themselves to do things differently than maybe the ways that things have always been done, we can see all of those things could potentially be political. And if that's your definition, and it's mine, all of those things are political, then it's impossible to be apolitical because we care about things. We care about the world around us. We care about those things that affect people that we know and also those things that affect people that we don't know. So in that sense, uh, an example, even something that meets, in, meets the news like um, flooding, right? Flooding in the north of Kazakhstan. If we take a sort of humanitarian approach to this and do relief efforts and collect money and things like that, some people would say, well, that's not political because it's not challenging the government. It's not saying we want to do things differently or that the gov it's the government's fault, fault because, uh, because this happened. Um, on the other hand, it's absolutely political because we're intervening in the world World in a way that says this situation is not okay. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. This situation is not okay. And we want to use our own efforts to do something about it. In that sense, if we see the whole world as like places that we can make change, well, then, I mean, that's politics as far as I'm concerned. And of course, we just can't stay apolitical because there's so many good things that we can do to change the world around us. And the reason why I was asking this question is because uh, there are so many people who just say, I don't want to talk about this. This is politics. So let's not talk about this. Or at the same time, on the other side, so many people who are like, you know, like, you know, the couch and criticizing the government and not doing anything on their side because it is indeed you know, it's not only about the government, but also about the people. And um, one of the trends that I've seen, uh, if we talk about being apolitical, political, is the uh, how young people in Kazakhstan have become so much active. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your observations on that? Uh, what's the role of young people in politics in general, if we speak about it? Yeah, I think that the that young people are realize that they can make a difference in the world and that they have a stake in the future of Kazakhstan. And this is a good thing, right? We yeah. want people to be active citizens. We want people to look around and say, oh, I can make a difference there and I can make a difference there and I can do something good in the world. And I think that young people are really starting to see that they have agency, they have the ability to make a change. Um, and this is partly maybe because there's increasing space, there's increasing space on social media where people can talk about things that they've never been able to talk about before. Um, there's space in civil society, there's space in business where people can take their creative ideas and do something about it, whether it's, you know, um, just teaching people about natural resources or whether it's about something like taking care of orphans or whatever it is, right? There's so many needs in society. Um, and Kazakhstan's no different than any other country on this. And I think that people, young people, are just seeing that there are these issues that need to be addressed. And if not them, 
who's going to do it? So why not just get your hands dirty and, and, and get busy doing something for the people around you? Exactly. And um, I want to move on to the main topic of the conversation, but I also want to ask you, I know that you spent years researching the migration policies, also comparative politics. Uh, could you share with us how did, you, uh, how did you end up in academia in the first place and why exactly these um, areas, research areas? Yeah, well, I, the short answer is it was kind of a mistake or I was just kind of following, <laughs> following my nose, following life. But um, the reality is I got interested in politics by looking at conflicts in the world. So looking at places like the former Yugoslavia, where people act in ways that you just can't even imagine. We can see the same thing in Ukraine, right? We look at Ukraine and we're like, we cannot fathom that people are at war, right? This is a modern world. Why are people killing each other? Um, and so to me, the, the, this drove me to ask the question, like, why do people act like this? And is there possibly a better way? And who gets to be in charge or who gets to influence a potential better way? So this led me into the study of politics. And as soon as I started poli studying politics, I thought, wow, this is amazing. I love it. I loved everything about it. Um, I didn't have a background in politics. My background was in music and it was in, uh, you know, kind of service industry and all of these sorts of things. And so for me, it was very strange to choose politics, but it just felt really meaningful. And um, then when it came to studying immigration, again, I was just kind of following what was interesting in the world. And I was looking at Russian politics at the time. And there was this uh, newspaper article that was talking about how migrants in Moscow were kind of finding themselves in ghettos, in, in kind of enclaves, ethnic enclaves, and that this wasn't good for society and it wasn't good for the migrants and all of this. And I was like, I want to study that. Um, what was interesting is once I got to Moscow and started asking people, well, what about the ways that migrants live? What are the consequences? Everybody that I met said, well, that's actually not important. What's really important is this policy that the government just adopted that's actually making life for migrants really, really horrible. And that's what I ended up writing my dissertation on. So it's kind of this circuitous route that you find yourselves just following the things that are the most interesting and the seem the most relevant. And that brought me to studying migration. And why do you think it is important to study and to talk about uh, migration, not only in academia, but also in the public between people? Yeah, I think because migrants are a really easy target, where they're a target, they're often other, they're seen as something that's not normal, or they're seen as something that is not us, they're something, they're interlopers, they're, you know, they're something that's different, and they're, they're something that's just not quite, maybe even right. Um, and because of that, I think migrants can become very vulnerable as a result. And obviously, when we talk about migrants, there's lots of different types of migrants and people move all over, you know, inside of countries and out, you know, from country to country. Um, there's high skilled migrants, there's low skilled migrants. But at the same time, all of these people are kind of dislodged in some ways. They're taken out of their kind of comfort areas and they're trying to make a way in a, a new context. And that is really fruitful and good in many ways. There's a lot of learning that can happen as a result, but it also comes with a lot of precarity in the sense that, you know, you can be really vulnerable when you don't know a legal system, when you don't have the same rights as citizens have. And so in order to kind of um, compensate for that kind of disbalance. I think migration and migrants need a lot of attention to just highlight the issues that maybe people don't realize that migrants are suffering from. And uh, coming next, um, one of the questions that I want to ask is in one of the webinars, you also mentioned that the uh, current migration theory is uh, pretty much biased towards, you know, Western uh, developed receiving countries. Uh, do you see any changes in migration theories? Do they really reflect the reality or maybe the recent developments, both globally and regionally, somehow uh, impact or turn these theories, you know, upside down? I think it's very slowly happening, but I think that this is something that's actually a bigger problem in academia more widely, right? That it's mostly focused in the US and Europe because that's where the money for intellectual sort of endeavors gets put. That's where the publishing houses are. Um, and so there's a lot of attention. There's a lot of kind of ideas that get dominance because 
people are just in those regions studying whatever it is that they're studying. Um, but it's certainly true of migration too. So migration studies at the beginning was very US centric, just thinking about the US's own migration problems, um, eventually was kind of extended to European studies or European states that also became migrant magnets. Um, and is only very slowly kind of extending out to now when we see kind of a handbook of migration studies, it's not uncommon to see a case of uh, South Korea, a case of Japan, um, maybe Turkey, maybe UAE. Um, Russia and Central Asia are still very, very rarely actually get um, included in these uh, in these large kind of comparative studies. Though the region is very big, I mean. Though the region is big, and I mean, Russia is one of the largest migrant receiving countries in the world. I mean, definitely receives more migrants than Japan or South Korea, and yet they were included in these kind of compendiums of migrant research much earlier than um, Russia has been. Not to say that there's not a lot of great work being done on Russia, but it doesn't always get, um, it doesn't always get into those conversations yeah. that are broadly comparative. And when it comes to migration, immigration, um, should I say migration correctly, what are some of the biggest challenges that countries overall face? I think that um, one of the biggest challenges is, like I said, just treating migrants like they're something different, right? Which kind of dehumanizes them, right? It treats them like, oh, well, you're something you don't deserve full rights. You don't deserve like the full ability to work. And you probably, our healthcare system probably shouldn't cover you because you don't belong and all of these things. I think that those kind of xenophobic phobic, um, tendencies or kind of impulses are really, really dangerous because it's a very slippery slope to say, okay, well, we want to protect jobs for our citizens to dehumanizing migrants in all sorts of ways that leads to violence, whether it's outright violence or sort of, you know, kind of other types of uh, more subtle violences. Yeah, and I've heard some of such statements from um, officials elsewhere in the world in the United States about, you know, protecting our jobs, which is um, doesn't doesn't make sense for me, actually. Yeah. Though it is one of the first things that I, at least I heard people say when we started to see a lot of Russian migrants come yeah. to Kazakhstan, well, but they're going to take all of our jobs, right? It's a knee-jerk reaction that everywhere, um, when you start seeing a lot of migrants, people start to get nervous about migrants taking their jobs. I'm a migrant, and I've definitely been accused of taking people's jobs in Kazakhstan. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I've sat in taxis and um, people have asked me, well, why do you why do you get this job and not somebody from uh, from our country? So I think that this is a very normal, not it's norm, normal, not normal, right? It's a very typical sort of response of people when it's when they just don't understand um, that. In fact, we have a lot more in common with each other as humans and as people than you know some sort of arbitrary kind of artificial borders and boundaries on a map um, would give us in terms of identity. And in the long term, what is uh, the long term impact of migrants flow into a particular country? If uh, we could say maybe about economic and social implications? Well, I think that the research is really divided. In fact, I was just having a conversation with some colleagues about the economic impact of migrants the other day, and they wanted to make the argument that migrants take jobs and they're bad for the economy. And I wanted to make the opposite argument that you know migrants are good for the economy, that they bring kind of vitality to the economy, they bring diversity to society. Um, and the reality is you can find you can find um, evidence for your whatever point you really want to make in, in the research, because the research is really diverse. Yeah. It demonstrates a lot of different things about complex human systems, right? So it's not just one way or the other. I think that in many ways, migrants can be quite good for society. Um, but depending on how people react to those migrants, it can create a lot of really negative outcomes. Do you think migration policies um, among countries depend on whether the state, let's say, more democratic or more authoritarian? I don't think so. So I think that that is one thing that the, the migration literature, the theory would like to say. And many people have tried to say, well, authoritarian countries tend to do these types of things. And the research again is mixed. Some people say, well, authoritarian countries are more open to migrants because their populations can't 
uh, they can't push back against the government policies. And then other people say, well, my, uh, authoritarian systems are more closed or more controlling. Um, and then on the other hand, you, you, you might say that, well, lots of people want to go to democracies because they have more rights. Um, but we also see research that uh, democratic countries really restrict the mi rights of migrants. So the research is really, really mixed. And so I don't think we can say categorically that authoritarian countries do this and democratic countries do this. Because I think in many ways, governments see some opportunities, some kind of disadvantages that they, that they um, you know, kind of want to avoid. I mean, look at Kazakhstan and think about how um, the government maybe wants to be really careful about Chinese migrants, but was pretty welcoming when we started to see a lot of Russian migrants. So even in one country, responding to two different migrant, migrant populations, um, is really context is depending, right? Depending on long his histories, depending on geopolitics, depending on how the population feels about it because the population in Kazakhstan has really, really made it clear that they like certain types of migrants or maybe that they really don't like other certain types of migrants. And the government pays attention to these things. And since we mentioned Kazakhstan and the region, I would like to ask you what are some of the trends that you have observed in the region over the recent years? Yeah, absolutely. I think that a couple of different things um, since the war in Ukraine, um, I think, and even before that, because of economic crisis in Russia, starting in 2008, 2010, we started to see maybe a few more migrants from Central Asia coming to Kazakhstan as kind of a secondary def, uh, destination. So maybe when things weren't so good in Russia, or sometimes when Russia was making policies that were really, really migrant unfriendly, it made it really hard for migrants to stay in Russia. We started to see more migrants um, come try to find work in Kazakhstan. So this would be migrants from Kyrgyzstan, from Uzbekistan, but we always have seen those migrants come because there's kind of this just general um, openness, right, among Central Asian countries. And so it's normal to work across those sort of boundaries, I think. Um, we also see, of course, um, as a result of um, mobilization in Russia, um, the result of you know, recruitment into the military, we saw a lot of Russian men leaving their country for lots of different reasons. Sometimes because they were really protesting the war, sometimes because they just didn't want to participate in the war themselves, sometimes for a variety of other reasons. Um, and so this made a huge impact on Kazakhstan. I mean, there was tens of thousands, actually hundreds of thousands of Russian men mostly, but also families that came into Kazakhstan within a really short, of, short period of time. And this drove up rent for prices and it caused people to be really nervous. Um, so that's been one of the big impacts, I think. Um, of course, recently in the last year, you see the introduction of a visa-free regime with China um, for business travel. Actually, I'm really surprised that this has not made more kind of had more resonance in society. It's actually been a fairly peaceful, fairly yeah. uneventful sort of development, which I'm actually surprised that it's, that it's turned out like that. And maybe that's because there's all of these other things going on geopolitically that people just don't, they don't have enough attention to give attention everywhere, right? You can't spend all of your, you know, spend all of your mind on everything that happens in the world. You kind of have to, you know, focus on, on the things that matter the most to you. Um, so I think those are the big kind of developments that have happened recently that, um, and they have to do with off, often really quite geopolitical events. Um, though Kazakhstan, I think, reacts in its own way, right? It's not that Kazakhstan has no choices because it's just the recipient of these sorts of geopolitical factors. So the idea that Kazakhstan has limited choices because we're right between Russia and China, I don't know. I don't think that that actually gives Kazakhstan the credit that it has due um, because it actually is quite adept at maneuvering and adapting to all of the different things that are going on around it and doing things in the country that matter a lot for the people in the country that have nothing to do with what's going on outside. And if we talk about the region, is there um, any kind of, you know, I don't like the word post-Soviet, but post-Soviet legacy that impacts migration policies? I think, yes, I think there is. So, I mean, again, if we go back to migration theory, which usually is quite Western-centric, um, it does tend to predict that migration will flow along 
colonial pathways. And if you look at the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire as a sort of colonial uh, sort of endeavor, then this is not all that surprising that, right, that once those, uh, once those countries are free, they'll still have linguistic ties, they'll still have economic ties that just make it easy to migrate through those pathways. Um, and then, of course, I mean, the familiarity, right, of, you know, being not that long ago in one country together, um, it's just easier, right, to conceive of I'm going to Kazakhstan or I'm going to Russia or I'm going to Ukraine prior to the war to, to try to find work because it's just easier, right? It's just within your imaginary of what's possible. Well, this is part of our world, right? That, that we all, wasn't that long ago that we were a country together. Um, so in that sense, it makes a lot of sense. The further though that we get away from the Soviet Union, the less linguistic ties we have, the more that people outside of Russia realize uh, we actually want to chart our own destiny. We want to break away from this legacy of the Soviet Union. And you know, in the recent years, um, I, I mean, uh, you've probably also noticed this, that more people in Kazakhstan are immersing into Kazakh culture, traditions, speaking more Kazakh. Um, do you think it has to do uh, with the, you know, this huge flow of migrants from Russia? Oh, wow, that's a really complicated question. Oh. It's really complicated yeah. because I think yes and no, right? I mean, I think that we already had this sort of impulse to Kazakh language revival even before um, Russians started coming in. But I think what, what made it complicated when Russians started coming was that in Kazakhstan, we realize that it's really complicated. And we're really, like, there's a lot of sensitivities. There's a lot of shame surrounding language repertoires, what languages you speak and what languages you don't speak. And everybody knows how to be really careful and how to be delicate and how to, you know, to navigate these, these sort of very, very fraught waters. Um, when Russians started coming and they said, well, we came here because we know that we can speak Russian. Well, that was really offensive to people because they because it wasn't recognizing that, okay, yeah, maybe people speak Russian here, but it's really, really complicated, right? It's not just that people speak Russian, it's that people feel like they should be speaking Kazakh or they maybe they do and maybe they don't and maybe they do in some certain spheres and then not in other certain spheres. And it's just really, really complicated. And I think people feel that complicated nature of language every day. But when Russians came, they didn't understand that it's complicated. And that was really offensive to people here, I think. And speaking about migration policies, is there such a word as an effective migration policy anywhere in the world? Or let's say ideal migration policy? It's a good question. I mean, I think you know, my ideal migration policy would be to say, just let everybody in who wants to come in, right? Just like, let's not regulate these things because we're all people. Right, and let's just work together to towards economic goals, towards social goals, towards what have you. That's not the way that the world works, right? Yeah, That's not that the way that the world is set up right now. Mm -hmm. So even though I think that would be better, it's not very realistic, right? And no policymaker could ever be elected on a platform where they said, let's throw the yeah. gates open wide, let's open all the borders and let everybody in. That would be political suicide. But I do think that there is a sort of law of migration that the more you try to control migrants, the less control you'll actually have. I mean, it's like child rearing too, right? The more controlling you are as a parent, the more your child is going to rebel, the more they're not going to actually flourish and grow to be the person that they can be. Um, same for migration. The more you try to control migrants, the less they're actually going to be able to contribute to society, whether it's economically, whether it's socially. I mean, migrants come with all sorts of really interesting ideas about the world. And take, for example, at the university where we teach, sometimes we'll get international students. And I love this because they bring in a different perspective that our local students don't necessarily have. And I can tell them, you know, as an American, well, you know, there's other perspectives outside of Kazakhstan, but if there's a classmate sitting next to them that's from Nigeria or from Turkey or from Pakistan and says, well, in our country, um, here's our experience. This speaks volumes, right? And I think if we give migrants their full ability to be themselves and to create 
contribute to society and to be heard, this is really amazing, right? Because we learn that there's more than one way of doing things in the world and that we can, you know, we can be really creative and we can think of lots of different ways to solve certain problems or accomplish certain goals or live together in society if we'll just be open to those sorts of things. But that openness is really scary, I think, for some people. And so I think the, the, the impulse is to control, is to close down the spaces that migrants can operate in um, and to make it harder for them actually to live and work and feel free in society. And I think that that actually really works at cross purposes. It really kind of um, is contrary to the idea of you know, the, all of the things that migrants can bring to society. And if we imagine a country that lets people in as an ideal, how would it balance, you know, all the risks that, risks that can stem? I mean, social implications, maybe social tensions with its own, maybe, um, you know, this welcoming uh, pattern. Yeah, I think it's a really important question. And I think a lot of it comes down to political messaging. So when we look at the ways that migrants are presented in the press, it's almost uniformly negative. Yeah. Why does it have to be that way? Well, I mean, because it gets votes, right? So like people tend to vote for politicians that have a sort of uh, resolute stance on migration. But if we change the narrative, to be to look more at the benefits that migrants bring people would start to believe that if you tell them you know the positive sides of this too i'm not sure why we only feel like negative messages are effective or necessary um, i think a lot of times politicians rule through fear rather than ruling through information and through truth um, because this truth, it's really complicated, right? But fear really narrows people down to kind of staying in their spaces and acting in really kind of uh, limited sorts of ways. But that's really like you're really stifling your own population. And so like if you give people just the positive messages of like, wow, migrants can really contribute to society, I think that would go a long way to, to at least convincing some people that um, migrants aren't necessarily a bad thing. So I really do think that messaging is a very, very powerful in the media, from the government, um, from civil society. And there's a lot of positive messaging that could be, uh, that could go out, that just isn't going out. And uh, this should have probably been the first question, but how does the academic literature define the word migrant? Because I'm, we are talking about migration, I'm, I'm just thinking uh, who is defined as a migrant? Yeah, sure. I think, I mean, migrants are kind of mobile people, right? Mm -hmm. So you can yeah. have migrants that are kind of internal migrants, you know, people that are moving from rural settings to urban settings within one country. Um, if they're moving across borders, certainly they're, you know, those are the typical migrants, right? Um, if they're moving permanently, sometimes we call them immigrants, but sometimes we call them immigrants if they're just moving into a place rather than out of a place. So these terms can really be quite flexible. Um, so migrant is a really nice umbrella term that can just be used to talk about mobile people, whether it's temporary or whether it's permanent. Immigrant sometimes means something more permanent, but sometimes is also just meant to mean a direction, like from here to there. Mm, I see. So a person, let's say a person from Kazakhstan who wants to work remotely from elsewhere in the world and moves there for a temporary period of time is um, defined as migrant, right? I would think so. Yeah, migrant. Because I've seen many cases right now with the, you know, interconnectedness of the world and with the globalization and all these visas, you know, the yeah. digital nomad visas yeah. that people are choosing if they have such chance to move somewhere else to, a, let's say, a warmer place and to work from there. And indeed, I've seen also the news that Kazakhstan also plans to introduce the digital nomad visa to attract uh, the talents from abroad. And that was quite a, a positive message and that I've noticed, you know, that let's uh, come here, work here, we'll bring you all the uh, necessary conditions for, for you. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think, again, I think Kazakhstan in some ways has done a really good job of opening itself to um, certain certain sectors of migration, right? Education migration, kind of high-skilled migration. And a lot of people have found that Kazakhstan is a really interesting place to live. 
Um, and so there's a lot of benefits, I think, that Kazakhstan can bring to, you know, the global sort of work workplace and um, kind of exchange of knowledge and exchange of labor. And I mean, there's a lot of really, really talented people, talented and creative people in Kazakhstan that just really benefit a lot from being in contact with people from abroad. And I mean, they influence people. I've been influenced so much by people, creative, wonderful people in Kazakhstan, just expanding my worldview and just letting me see that the world is bigger than the way that I conceived of it before I moved here. And at the same time, we've seen many cases, you know, what they call brain drain, mm. that uh, all the talented people, if we focus on Kazakhstan, are also leaving the country for various reasons to work abroad, to move abroad. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not really, I haven't researched where the government has done to attract them back, but it's still, I think it's uh, quite a negative, right, trend? I think it can be, yeah, it can be a negative and it, it can, yeah, if, if, the, if the most talented and bright people are not finding their long-term prospects in Kazakhstan, this can be really tragic, right? Because we want to keep and retain and, and we want people to feel invested that, you know, here's the place that you live and it's a great place that people um, need your input, right? That you, a lot of good can be done here. I know that the government does attract back uh, certain really, really highly skilled, um, highly professional people. Um, I think one very radical suggestion on my part is that um, the citizenship policy is really, really closes the doors to retain uh, ties with highly skilled professionals because Kazakhstan only allows one citizenship. Yeah. Yeah. If people were allowed to have two citizenships, this would allow people to retain their ties with Kazakhstan while they work uh, abroad for a time. And they would be more, it would be a more flexible arrangement where people could see um, Kazakhstan as still their home, but also potentially America or Europe yeah. as their home as well. And it wouldn't close the door. So I, unfortunately, Kazakhstan's current citizenship policy is like a loyalty test. And you have to either remain 100% loyal or give up your loyalty altogether. And that I think is a really, really hard choice that a, a lot of people probably wouldn't want to make. And if we had the opportunity to keep citizenship in Kazakhstan while still also having citizenship elsewhere, it might actually help to forge those intellectual ties and keep those ties really strong. And my last question is uh, probably more personal, is what is your, let's say, go-to source to learn about the politics or what is your main source of learning um, the political news, not only in Kazakhstan or Central Asia, but also abroad? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I look at a lot, a lot of um, just news sources, right? So I tend to, I don't look at American news sources, right? Because they, <laughs> I tend to look at um, news sources, some that are in the region, some that are um, uh, international. Um, I look at, I tend to th look at Facebook a lot for like what, what my colleagues think is really important or Twitter for what my colleagues are finding important in the world. Um, I look at what my students find really important. So the things that come up in class as the things that are important for students, I like to dig into those a little bit more, whether it's domestic violence or whether it is the flooding or whether it's um, you know something that's going on. Because of Kyrgyz, um, uh, Tajik conflict that happened. Those were things that I first got to know about because of the people around me, my, my community and uh, students included. Um, those things became really important to them. And so then I was able to, they were on, they became on my radar in a way that maybe they wouldn't have. A lot of times these are things that are important to people but they aren't in mainstream news sources. And um, so, I mean, I think students uh, tend to get their, a lot of their information from TikTok and Instagram, which I don't because I'm like, it's a generational divide or something like this, like, I don't understand. Um, but they get their information from these places. I get my information from these other places. These aren't necessarily um, news, like kind of traditional news sources like, uh, you know, BBC or CNN or something like that. Actually, what we're living as politics sometimes only goes to CNN or The Economist months and months later after we've already been living through it. And so if we're relying on those kind of mainstream news sources, we're, they're, all, they're just too late to the game. They were just, they're, things are mostly already done by the time they actually find it important enough to talk about them. That's all my questions. Thank you very much, Karis, for this insightful conversation. Okay, thank you so much.